Court of Appeals is at best a but see. You read it and you say, hmm, that doesn't seem quite right. Or it's hard to explain how you apply it consistently in other cases. So we're pleased that this court granted the petition for review and we'll look at these issues again. And the four issues I'm going to address are, number one, what is the legal effect of electing to dissolve a limited liability company and having the articles canceled saying, we're out of business? Does that terminate the operating agreement? Number two, when do the covenants of a contract, particularly a right to share in the profits of an LLC, which is effectively a partnership, no longer exist? Do those covenants survive its termination in the absence of an express provision for continuation? And number three, is this operating agreement ambiguous? And to me, this is one of the most troubling questions because it's an application of the rule of the Latin rule expression of one excludes the other. That's the way the court interpreted this to be ambiguous. I think that's very problematic. And finally, if this operating agreement is ambiguous, does that really necessarily mean there is a question of fact for trial? Now, on the first question, the effect of an election to dissolve. By its nature, an operating agreement has the purpose of providing for the operation of a limited liability company. When the company ceases to exist, it cannot have meetings, elect managers, hire employees, make contracts. It's not contemplated. It's that you're saying, no, I don't want to be your partner anymore. We're going to go out of business. We are not doing any new business. We can only wind up, and when it's wound up, it's over. Mr. Oliver, can you point me to your best support in the statute for this automatic termination at the dissolution of the LLC? Uh, there are a, a number of statutes. I don't think there's one directly on point. Right. There are statutes that suggest you should not conduct business and that say the only thing that the managers can do or that the only thing a member can do after you've elected to dissolve is wind up. You can't do new things. But the corporation code specifically in 176807, speaks to the continuation of the corporation for winding up purposes, and it has some specific language that says, quote, but not for the purpose of continuing the business for which the corporation was organized, end quote, which would be wonderful if it applied here for LLCs, but it does not. And what does that mean when the legislature puts that specific language in the corporation code but does not put it in the limited liability company code? Or do you understand what I'm asking? I understand you? what you're saying, and I've addressed it many, many, many times that the LLCs, their invention has been a sad chapter in the law in my opinion, because we had well-established corporate law, well-established partner law, and then we quickly, for tax reasons, letting the tail wag the dog, come up with the LLC code. And that, which is not the same as either, but for most purposes, I think you find the courts interpreting a limited liability company to be the equivalent of a partnership it's a partnership for tax purposes. It's a partnership for purposes of federal court jurisdiction. It's been held to be a partnership in Kansas for purposes of instructing how, juries on limit on. Uh, how does that translate then? I uh, think it translates if you if I tell you I don't want to be your partner, and I'm not your partner, I quit. Then and I have a right to do that under the partnership agreement, a right to quit, and granting a right to cause a dissolution is a right to say, I quit. I am not your partner anymore. And that that terminates our agreement with respect to any ongoing business, and I don't see how you can read the limited liability code if you're looking for, what do you imply? I think you have to imply that when you say we terminate, we dissolve, we liquidate, that it's the equivalent of what is expressly stated in the corporation code. I can't, I can't read it any other way to say we don't want to do any new business, but yes, we will. Putting aside statutory that, did, that, did I get to make any sense out of that? I think that's what you're saying when you say I dissolve. I quit. Okay. That, I asked you about statutory support. Now yes. let's look at the operating agreement itself mm -hmm. on termination. 
what what's your best what's your best interpretation that shows us that it was intended to terminate at the at the uh, dissolution of the LLC? There is one section in the agreement, section 1.6, that's entitled term. And it says, but instead of saying this agreement, it says the company shall exist for a period of 50 years unless terminated sooner by dissolution as provided in this agreement or in the LLC Act. And the LLC agreement effectively gives either partner, either member, the right to terminate. And so if you look at it, it's built into the agreement that the parties necessarily contemplated that the agreement and the company were coterminous. They were one and the same. That when you look for the term of the agreement, it is the term of the company. I have something more basic that I'm having <clears throat> trouble getting my right. arms around. Well, the bottom line dispute here is your client manages medical facilities and Iron Mound wants a piece of the management fees. Correct. It's more or less a commission for having gathered up uh, these people for your client to manage. Is that a fair summary? Yes, I believe it is. So basically we're talking about a commission agreement between Nutera and Iron Mound. And what we're looking at is an operating agreement for a completely separate limited liability company. And I guess I'm, my, my basic question is how do we get from an operating agreement where the members agree how that LLC is going to be operated into a separate uh, commission agreement that just happens to involve some of the members of this LLC. What, why doesn't that have to be in its own contract? Why is it implied from an operating agreement whose purpose is to set forth how the LLC is going to operate? Great question. I'll try to answer it directly. The provision comes in in the allocation of profits of the partnership. And rather than, they could have made a separate agreement, I will pay you a commission if you get me this business. That's a little disingenuous because the agreement says zero goes to the LLC. Yeah. So it doesn't flow through the LLC, and it's not an allocation of profits for the LLC because the LLC gets zero. But it's because they, they have specially allocated these in a different percentage than other partnership profits. And that doesn't mean it's a separate agreement. When you look at this, we agree that they get 20% of the fees from this center for some period of time. And that fee then is 7% of the revenues collected for that center by the manager. And so when we came to the end of the five-year term and they said we won't renew, we want to drop the fee to 4%. So you know that over the long run, you cannot pay a 20% commission on something forever and be competitive. You will not be in business. And so this only makes sense if you then put it in the context of an ongoing business where there are some other benefits of being partners, new business opportunities, new things to do together, other things that generate revenues, because this, as a standalone proposition, just doesn't work. I mean, after the, the initial term, you can't do it if there is no ongoing partnership. I guess I'm a little confused because I... Your company didn't object as uh, the five years, the initial five-year contract was proceeding uh, when there was the, uh, the LLC decided it was terminating, basically. There was a letter sent, I think, is that right, saying, you know, we think that might terminate your membership. But the 20% the, the got paid throughout the five years. For the initial term, yes. Right, and nobody was jumping up and down and saying, well, you you know, the LLC has dissolved or, or anything like that. I guess I'm confused as to why 
the objection came at the end of the five years in the beginning of the new contract ok that goes to the issue of of whether well is that conduct that you can use to interpret the contract if you find it's ambiguous and our position is here's what the testimony was testimony was why did you keep paying it for the first five years the answer from the boss was the man who's the president of the company is that it was set up on our books and I, I just really didn't even think about it until we got to looking at the new contract and so it just got paid but frankly then we looked at it and anybody thought about should you go back and object to this and our view was that right that was a contract made during the term of the agreement oh. and we ought to go ahead and pay it it's like completing a vested right it's doing the liquidation and it's not worth fighting about and can they really complain why you dirty no good you paid me a whole bunch of money you don't owe me wasn't well, and therefore I, you misled me or you misinterpreted the contract in some way we could resolve that doubt in their favor and didn't have to pick a fight over it did we well i i isn't your better argument really under 10.2 that at the time that contract was made under the language of 10.2 in the first paragraph, they were a member? Because it, it provides that you can contract with the company and the percentage of revenue specified below to be received by the company and allocated among the members, meaning at the time the contract is made, you're they going to allocate members. the percentage among the members. They were a member at that time, right. but they weren't a member five years later when, we when that contract terminated and the new contract began. Isn't that really that's a better argument? That's the way argument? we resolved it, yes. That's exactly what our thinking was. They're not a member at the time of the new contract, and that's, that's the initial determination. That's where you make the decision whether they're entitled to fees or not. Yeah, we always understood that the contract would be the original one, the one we made up front, and well, that it we didn't understand. go on for just ever and ever. We understand that, but but what we're trying to do is, is dovetail this into wh what we have. And what right. we have is an LLC that was terminated. Correct. And one of the assets, you're telling me that by the language, this commission, right to commission, was an asset of the LLC even though the LLC got 0%, it still flowed through the operating agreement. Is, is that your argument? The right did not exist independent of the operating agreement. Oh, okay. Agreement. So then the ordinary circumstance is when you terminate an LLC, you wind up the affairs and you distribute the assets. Mm -hmm. And there are certain um, provisions on how that's to be done. Why was that asset, the commission, distributed uh, uh, differently, uh, you know, technically, New Terra should have got a piece of that asset, shouldn't it? But if you continue to play 20%, that means that Iron Man got the whole, whole asset. I mean, how does that fit into the language of the operating agreement? That it is a special allocation of revenues, 20% to them, and 80% to us, and none set aside to share in a different percentage through the operating agreement. But you still have to be a member under the language that Justice Moritz quoted to be entitled to anything. And when you wind up, if you've got something that's payable in installments and you can't collect it now, like say you had a five-year lease and you needed to correct collect the rest of the rent you would still go ahead and you can't collect it early when it comes in you pay it is is the question of fact though whether or not it's the contracts that, that is the asset or whether it's the client relationship that is the asset I don't the the, the business I think connection the contract with the, is the asset but do, I mean does isn't that the question of whether or not the parties contemplated that ongoing having that the commission is due because we have established this ongoing relationship and does that terminate or does that continue as almost as a, a goodwill type of thing perhaps that you would have as an asset of a corporation so I understand the question but I think to, to get there you're implying things that aren't in the contract that you know this is really an odd duck thing <laughs> 
and maybe that would have been better if the contract had been written to segregate it out, but it doesn't. It puts it in on the consideration that we're splitting this because we're partners. We're in business together. And when we cease to be in business together, the reason for that ceases. But the obligation that exists, because it was made while we were partners, continues till that contract expires. And that's the way we interpret it. It's a logical, reasonable interpretation, and it's not inconsistent with the position we're advocating that we couldn't do new business and had no obligation to pay a share of a new contract made after the expiration. In order to be entitled to summary judgment, though, it has to be the only way to look at it, pretty much, doesn't it? And there's certainly dispute between the parties about the inter interpretation of 10.2. The, the cases are that's pretty... Your, that's your last question in yeah, your okay. four, I think, let me, let me <laughs> that you listed at the beginning. That, Justice Meyer, in <laughs> the, to say, parties often come into court and say, I think this contract means X, and the other says that means Y. That does not mean that it's ambiguous. Right, and it doesn't mean that if you resort to the extrinsic evidence, that it really helps you, that it's really consistent or inconsistent or creates fact issues. You still can have an ultimate legal question that is decisive. And we think there is contract. one here. We say that's a matter of law, yeah. interpretation of written contract. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Good morning. Uh, Jeffrey Carmichael appearing on behalf of Iron Mound. Let me just lay out an issue. I think it was a question was asked to make sure that we're clear on this. My client, Iron Mound, did the gathering of the doctors who were investors in the specialty hospital. My client built the specialty hospital. That's what they do. That's their business. Now, Nutera has the business of managing, and together they had some, some synergy of putting them together. If we build and get the doctors, they can then manage the facility. The agreement that was reached in the LLC was if we do that, if we put together the deal, if we build the hospital, and you then manage the facility, we get a portion of the fee that's being paid for putting that together. That's the agreement between Nutera and Iron Mound. Correct. That's came the... to that. My problem is 177663G defines an operating agreement for an LLC, which is a different entity here than the two that you've just spoke about having the agreement. Would you agree with that? No. It's part of the operating agreement. The LLC is a different legal entity than Iron Man or Nutera, or not? The LLC is a is an entity. The operating and agreement the, is it how it was the an entity that was formed under the laws of Kansas that deal with limited liability corporations, and those laws define operating agreement as being of the members and as to the affairs of the LLC and the conduct of its business. Correct. And my question is, why does the agreement between Iron Mound and New Terra that predated the formation of the LLC have to do with the affairs of the LLC or the conduct of the LLC's business? Everything I just talked about is in the operating agreement. The operating agreement sets forth the relationship of the parties. I, I know it's in, in there, but the... What I'm saying is that the laws governing the LLC do not contemplate that the operating agreement is a commission agreement between two, two parties. It contemplates that it has to do with the affairs of the LLC. And why is this commission agreement the affair of the LLC is my question. It's the manner in which the LLC is to be operated. This is what's going to go on in terms of the overall operations of the LLC. So it is part of the affairs. Part of the affairs is how we manage ourselves between one another. And part of that is how we're going to divide commissions, and that was part of the agreement that's put into the operating agreement and how the LLC was to be operated. And it does, under paragraph 10.2, have specific agreements with regard to the division of commissions, including a special provision for the Manhattan facility that in the event they were able to get a management uh, agreement for Manhattan that there would be a division in the LLC of 0% for Nutera, 20% for Iron Mound. And that then sets up an asset 
because my clients performed. I, I think we're talking past each other. If, if the statutes define LLC, uh, the operating agreement, as being uh, of the members and as, uh, applying as to the affairs and the conduct of business of an LLC, why doesn't, uh, if the LLC uh, ceases to operate, why doesn't the operating agreement cease to operate? Because there's specific provisions in the operating agreement which deal with disillusion of the LLC, which is paragraph 15. Your question earlier to Mr. Oliver and, about... And in paragraph 15, now that you mention it, under 15.2, it specifically says that the cash flow sharing of Article 10 will occur, quote, during the period of liquidation, end quote. That tends to refute your argument here that the operating agreement contemplates a continuation of the cash flow sh sharing if upon dissolution that cash flow sharing only applies during the period of liquidation. The cash flow sharing, I believe, Your Honor, would have to be inconsistent with the rights of the parties uh, under that operating agreement. The rights of the parties as set forth were and as, op no, and, and no, as the parties agreed, because no, fifth, that's the way it was paid. And that's under Section 10. And 15.2, of course, it used a Roman numeral, uh, uh, but I think it says X and X1 articles. And so it specifically refers back to the Article 10 that you're arguing gives Iron Man the continuing uh, right to share in that cash flow. When 15.2 says that only applies during the period of liquidation. That's not, a, that's not cash flow, Your Honor. I think that's maybe the distinction we're going to have here. That was an asset, an asset that my client had earned. My client performed in total with regard to Manhattan. They did what they were supposed to do. They got Nutera into the management position. Having done that, they have now earned the right to 20% of any management fee paid. But the asset, I'm sorry. To new term. The asset was that contract Correct. under under the agreement under 10.2. The asset is the contract that's entered into, and under the agreement, if you're a member when that contract is entered into, then you're entitled to the revenue sharing fees as set forth down the line. But you got to be a member. So what makes your company a member when a new contract is entered five years later? Even if they were entitled to continue sharing the fees and we're not being asked to decide that while the, your company is in dissolution, are you suggesting your company remains a member post-dissolution forevermore for purposes of this operating agreement? Not a member, but they've earned the right to the asset. That, but you only get the right to the asset if you're a member. And member is capitalized and member has a definition. How long is your company a member after they dissolve Keep in mind company. that my client fully performed. They did what they I'm were supposed to do. I'm not asking if they fully performed. I'm asking. And I'm going to get to the answer are, to your question. Twenty years from now, are they still a member under Section 10.2? Had and to me, this is a timing issue. Had Nutera wanted to limit the time frame that they had to pay this obligation, they could have put it in the agreement. We only have to pay you one year's of, uh, worth of the management but fee. But what they put in the agreement and what you both put in the agreement is that if there is a contract, then the members are entitled to the percentages set forth below. That's what you put into the agreement. There was a contract. You got those percentages. We're not being asked to decide whether you should have continued to get that percentage from that contract. The question is, when there's a new contract after you your company has terminated membership, are they still entitled ad infinitum to Absolutely. say they're a member of, a, of an agreement that they've terminated? Not ad infinitum, but until they cease being, until Nutera ceases being the operator of that facility. Keep in mind What that, about that, the that membership? Were... What about the membership? Are they still a member? And no, what, they're not what a in... member. Okay, so what, but why are they But keep in mind that, that there's no distinction between the first contract and the second contract. It's the same thing. They testified, testimony from the 
um, manager, the owner of the of the Manhattan surgical facility, said there's no distinction between contract number one and contract number two. They do well, the same that's thing. That's a question of fact, whether there's a distinction. And there isn't any question, is there, that the first contract did terminate? No question at all. Right. So that there was a new contract entered into. Whatever the terms of that were, there's a new contract entered into five years later. To do the exact same things that they were doing under the other But contract. it's a new contract. And Absolutely at the time the new, new contract. contract's entered into. And had Duterra you, wanted to limit my client's right to recover, my client's right to be paid that amount, they could have put a limit in. This only applies to the first contract. This only applies for two years. This only applies for five years. And they didn't do it. Or vice versa, perhaps your company could have put in saying, this applies ad infinitum, regardless of whether we're a member anymore of this company. I think once it's an asset, if you take a look at the Litton case from the U.S. Supreme Court, it talks about contract rights. Contract rights continue if they have accrued or vested uh, at the time of the termination of the agreement. And that's certainly true of Management Agreement 1. I think... Justice Very Lawrence true. is trying to get you to focus on the fact that we're not here about Management Agreement 1, only insofar as it may be relevant to help determine the terms of an I ambiguous contract. We're here about Management Agreement 2. And we're trying to draw your attention to the fact that there's no distinction. At the time, that's, that's your argument, but at the time you, the Management Agreement 2 was entered into, your client was no longer a member of the LLC. That's correct. Isn't my it? client a had invested or earned accrued right. That's not my question. I understand your question. And what's my the client answer? had an accrued right to the counsel. What's answer, the answer to my answer question? Answer the justice's question, and then you can tell us what you'd like to tell us. I understand, but at the time that management agreement two was entered into, your client was no longer a member of the LLC. That is true. Okay, that's. I think that's all that sh that Justice Moore. That's has what been I was trying, trying to get, get you to. Thank you. What I was trying to focus in on is the fact that that it's an accrued right, a right to receive twenty percent of management fees paid to Nutera, and it doesn't say twenty percent only under the first contract. It says twenty percent of management fees if you manage Manhattan facility. There is no time limitation anywhere in the contract. And that, I believe, is the reason that my client has a right to additional fees after the first contract, management contract, is over. It's an accrued right that continues because we put them in that position. We performed. Iron Mound got them that position. And they've now continued that position. And we've earned the right to 20% of the management fees paid. In other words, Nutera continues to pocket the money and saying to Iron Mound, thanks, but no thanks, we're not going to pay anything else. And that, I think, is what is unfair and improper about this particular situation. A contract right had accrued. Nothing interfered with its continuation with the second contract, management contract, and that right still exists. And it should be paid, and it is payable. Um, that's, a, in essence, an equitable argument, and I want to talk about language of the contract and language of the statute the same way that I did with your opponent today. Um, I asked him what his best support was for the idea that the operating agreement automatically terminated at dissolution of the LLC. Are you suggesting today to us that it did not automatically terminate or that it automatically terminated but this provision survived? What's your position today? I think it's somewhere in between. It is that there is a disillusion provision, 15.2, which takes over. And that survives, the, that survives the dissolution of the LLC. That tells you what you're supposed to do. In other words, the fact that you dissolve the LLC does not immediately terminate the operating agreement. 15.2 says here are things that should be done. And those are post-termination issues. Okay. Termination of the LLC. And one of those is distribution of assets. An asset was distributed to my client, the 20% right to the, the gross management fee from Manhattan. And why do we know that that it was distributed to my client? Because it was paid for five years post dissolution of the LLC. So let me make sure I understand you. I just want to be sure that we're on the same page. You're saying that generally speaking, the operating agreement provisions are no longer of any force and effect at dissolution of the LLC, with the exception of those provisions in 15.2 that deal with winding up, and that includes how to distribute the money under 10.2. That's your position. 
I think my position is paragraph 15.2 would govern the dissolution of the LLC post-termination. Okay. Now, whether that's the only provision, I'm not sure it is, because it makes reference to other provisions in the operating agreement in 15.2. So I'm not going to say no no other provisions are applicable because they're incorporated into that paragraph. So I understood your position coming into today to be that um, remand was appropriate per the Court of Appeals decision. That summary judgment was not due your client. But are you saying today that you think 15.2 is unambiguous and clear and entitles your client as a matter of law to judgment? We did file a cross appeal. I know that, but for summary judgment. But that was not pursued on petition for review up here. The court of appeals didn't find that or hold that. The court of appeals held that you were going back to district court. I'm just trying to discern whether your position's changed or, or, so or let me, what. Let me to, clarify this. Here if if we're su- if we're successful at the at the court of appeals, we have to file a petition for review also. The, you were not successful on the issue of whether summary judgment was do your client. You were not successful on that. The Court of Appeals said summary judgment is inappropriate for either party. This is going back to district court. Isn't that correct? That's what the Court of Appeals held. They did. Okay. So I'm just asking you. So we have to file a petition for review then, even though we're successful in the Court of Appeals and have won. I think there's, well, you you didn't win entirely because you didn't get the summary judgment you were asking for at the district court. You understand that? We're successful from the standpoint that the case was going to go back to the Court of Appeals. And and I'm asking you, as you stand here today, does that satisfy you or are you is your just your last argument you made based on fifteen point two an argument that as a matter of law you're entitled to judgment? I'm just asking you what your position is. I, I think it is. As a matter of law, I think we're entitled to judgment. That's what we briefed. That was part of our briefing process. That that is, I think, an issue that, that the court could certainly reach at this point, that it's not ambiguous. As I understand it, you're to consider at this point, uh, de novo, the issue of the appropriateness of summary judgment. And, and I think in reviewing that, you could very easily conclude, yes, summary judgment is appropriate, only appropriate for Iron Mound in this situation. Let me clarify. You rely heavily on 15.2 and... You indicated that I had misread that because where it says cash flow profits and losses during the period of liquidation in the manner set forth in Articles 10 and 11 um, uh, doesn't apply because we're talking about an asset, not a cash flow. Correct. Um, The paragraph was sent right before before that. that, it, It says the assets of the company may be liquidated or distributed in kind. Correct. So you're saying that the commission agreement that was allocated in uh, Section Article 10 was not an allocation but a, a commission contract that was distributed in kind to your client upon dissolution, liquidation. I believe that's true, although I'm not sure necessarily we call it a commission contract. I think it's a contract right that was allocated as an asset, which is what the Court of Appeals found in its opinion, that that was a, the only asset. I, I won't quibble about uh, semantics. The whole thing is it's a contract right to receive 20% of Nutera's management contract. Absolutely. Okay. And, and you say that's an asset that was distributed in kind to Iron Mount. Correct. And is there anything to support that other than it must be true because Nutera paid the 20%? Is there anything to support that there was a distribution of that asset it was testified to by the parties that that was the asset that w- that that Iron Mound was to receive again, as reported in the Court of Appeals opinion. That A. J. Schwartz testified that that was the asset he understood that that Iron Mound was to receive. That again it was reported in the Kansas Court of Appeals opinion that that was testimony that they re- that the court relied upon in reaching that determination. It was an asset. It was distributed, and and reinforced by the fact that that's exactly what occurred. For that time frame, I think it's a little bit 
disingenuous to say, well, that's just a coincidence that it was paid to him. No, it was an asset that was allocated to him. It was significant and paid to them on a regular basis. The issue then becomes, I believe, for this court, is there anything that indicates a timing that it ends at the end of the first contract? And I think the answer is no. It's a contract right. If they get paid a commission, excuse me, if they get paid a management fee, we get 20%. Are they still getting management fees? Yes, they are, without doubt. So what you're saying then is that any contract, no matter when it's executed, is an asset that you're entitled to distribution despite, despite termination of the LLC? It's a separate, it's, a separate contract, future right. contracts, future contracts are somehow pulled in retroactively. It's not a future contract. It's a contract right. If they get when paid did, a commission. When did it become a contract right? When it, the contract was made? When my client performed and got them in the management position. When, that so occurred it was pre, in 1999. Pre-execution of this contract. No, in, in connection with the execution, shortly after the execution of this contract. After the management agreement was entered into. Management agreement two I'm talking about here. Excuse me, I was talking about the operating agreement. I, I'm apology. asking how do you, how can you, how can you make management agreement two, which is executed after your company is no longer a member, how can that be an asset that you're entitled to distribution of? Because the, you need to define what the asset is. The asset is the right to receive 20% of management fees paid to Nutera if they manage Manhattan. And it doesn't say only under contract one. It doesn't say for five years. It says to members. It says a contract is entitled, if there is a contract, that members are entitled to distribution of that contract. That's, that's the asset, the contract that members participate in. It's a contract in. right, mm -hmm. the 20% of any management fees. You don't get there without the contract is what I'm saying. Right. Members take still, part in that. There's still a contract. But they're not a the member. contract is initiated. Okay. It's the same thing. I think I, think I see what you're... They, they got the same benefit they had under the first contract. Mm -hmm. They're still the managers. You know, Mr. Armstrong said, well, we, ha we have to pay, take a lesser amount under the new contract. Well, 20% of a lesser amount is a lesser amount. My client gets less, too. It doesn't change. We don't get 20% of a fixed figure. It's 20% of what they get. Mr. Carmichael, huh? do you agree with your opponent that um, the operating agreement is what gave your client any right to this commission or cut? Yes. Okay. You don't have any rights independent of the operating agreement? I'm sorry? You have no rights independent of the operating agreement? I, we have not asserted any, and I don't think that that would be appropriate at this point for us to change position. Our position has been well, that it arises under paragraph 10.2. That confuses me because I understood your argument to be to, to draw an analog with a real estate um, agent um, that's looking for a willing buyer, uh, the listing agreement uh, uh, expires, uh, but the seller nevertheless ends up selling the house to someone that the agent brought into the picture. Uh, we've said that give that agent has a has a right to the commission, even though the actual contract expired. And I understood you were arguing the same way that that. Uh, this all occurred because of your client's uh, good work um, that had been contracted to do and that on a quantum merit or an equitable basis, it gets to continue to, to uh, uh, share in the bounty of what it helped produce. Uh, but now you're telling me it all that, that it must flow from the operating agreement or you're telling Justice Byer. Is, it, is that my understanding? That is. Yeah, I understand. And that is that my client performed. Once we performed, that right accrued. And that right is payable as 20% of any management fee that Nutera would earn at Manhattan. I understand you get that from the first part of 10.1c. But how do you reconcile that with the, about the middle of that paragraph of 10.1c where it says that um, the revenue from the Topeka Sliner or Manhattan Center is contemplated on the date of execution 
And then, then the next line, it says, from the management services to be received by the company shall be distributed as follows. If there's no company, how does that continue? Because the contract right is distributed at, when the dissolution of the company. But, that but contract this right is... Narrow that contract right to the revenues received by the company. I think a contract right, once it accrues, is a right to receive a benefit. We fully performed. We're entitled to the benefit of that performance. And that benefit is 20% of management fees that they receive, Nutera receives, at, at Manhattan. The fact that the, that the LLC dissolves does not immediately dissolve the right my, for my client to receive the 20%. Evidence of the fact they kept paying it. So you want us to read out that language? No, I don't want you to read out the language. The I want you to enforce, I believe, what I think is a contract right. The contract right my client had accrued, the right to 20% of management fees if they manage Manhattan. That's what we want. And is that your answer to Justice Lukert's question about how you would explain this language? <clears throat> yeah, I believe so, yeah. Because the, the language is that my client earns 20%, to the, it says to the company, but that asset upon dissolution is, 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 uh, excuse me, is distributed to my client. So the asset that goes to the company goes to my client. That's what happens when you distribute assets. Whoever gets it, gets that asset. What is the asset? 20% of the management fees for management of the, of the Manhattan facility. That's the asset well, that's in distributed. Your, in your brief, you refer to it pretty consistently as 20% of the management fees generated by the defendant from the surgical center contract. Not just the management fees, but the fees generated by the contract. Right. And that's different uh, because the contract now is a different contract. Well, factually, we're not. It's not. We're not talking about the same contract. I think we are, okay. because the, the people at, at at the management at the surgical center said it's the same agreement. It's the same people doing the same things, okay. even though it's been extended in time. It's the same agreement. So your argument really all has to hinge on us saying that management agreement two is the same agreement as management agreement one. That the right to 20% doesn't have any time limitation, doesn't limit itself just to the first agreement. That the contract you're referring to, the 20% of the contract, is either contract because they're one and the same. Yes. Okay. The right exists, it accrued, it, my client has a right to it. Okay. I see where counsel's well out of time. Do we have any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. And you had reserved four minutes for rebuttal. I'll wait it. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions of counsel? If not, the uh, court will take this matter under advisement. We thank both counsel.